Hey, it's Justin Harvey. Thanks for tuning in to the Anesthesia and Pain Management Success Podcast. With APM Success, we take a close look at important topics pertaining to business, practice management, personal finance, and careers for anesthesiologists and pain management physicians. We work hard to take your critical questions straight to the experts. Thanks for listening. Hey, Brian, how are you? Thanks for joining. Great. How are you? Uh, I'm doing awesome. We're uh, the time of this recording. It's the end of December. Today is my parents' anniversary. Happy anniversary, mom and dad. I know my mom is one of those listeners out there. There's her and the other four people that are going to listen to this podcast. So, um, How many years? Oh, 39, which is super oh, nice. exciting. Get that closing down on the big 4-0. Very nice. Um, so today I... I am pleased to be joined by Dr. Brian Schmutzler. He is one of those people that has a unique perspective, having interacted with the medical ecosystem and anesthesiology in particular in basically every possible <laughs> facet from academics, private practice, doing locums work, running a locum slash placement company or however you describe what you do. And you're also somebody, Brian, who has the, the business savvy and the understanding of the key players uh, to be able to help the lay medical person uh, understand a little bit about the context in which they're functioning. So I'm excited for today's conversation. Also next week, we're going to have another detailed conversation about the sort of the anesthesia environment. So thanks for joining. Um, why don't you sort of dive into the way that we had framed today's conversation in terms of the different types of care providers, the geographic breakdown, what it means for physicians or CRNAs or AAs in different parts of the country and all of the stuff that comes with that. Yeah. Hey, uh, well, thank, thanks for having me on, Justin. Appreciate it. We've, we've done this together a few times, so hopefully we have a pretty good back and forth. Um, so I, uh, as we were talking before, I started sort of a big social media push on my end, um, just sort of putting some some content out there. And I was getting a lot of questions, both from people in medicine and not in medicine, um, about the differences in the types of anesthesia providers. And so Justin and I thought, hey, maybe maybe we just take a, a deep dive into the different types of anesthesia providers, what that means in terms of, like like you said, location, and then what that means in terms of scope, scope of practice. And then from my perspective, what it means in terms of the, the business of anesthesia. So um, I'll just lay this out kind of step by step. So, uh, you know, I know a lot of people who listen to this are anesthesiologists. So, um, Anesthesiologists will do four years of undergrad, take the MCAT, four years of medical school, and then four years of residency. One of those years being either a kind of combined medicine anesthesia year, or some people just do a straight medicine year, and some do, it's called the transitional year, which is what I did, um, where I got to do a little bit of everything. Um, so after those four years of medical school and then into the, the four years of residency, some people then go and do a fellowship. There's probably 10 or 12 fellowships out there now. I'm a general anesthesiologist. I did not do a fellowship, but you certainly could do uh, cardiac anesthesia, pediatric anesthesia, um, critical care anesthesia. There's neuroanesthesia fellowships. There's regional uh, and acute pain medicine fellowships, chronic pain fellowships, OB anesthesia fellowships. I'm probably missing some. The uh, sleep medicine, um, I think uh, end of life, palliative care. There's a ton of them out there now. So, um, so that that's the process. And then after that, you start as as staff. Uh, so you know, a total of somewhere between twelve and fourteen years of uh, of training after uh, high school. Um, I did a PhD as well, which added three years, but that's not a typical <laughs> typical route for most anesthesiologists. Um, and then sort of the the next thing we'll talk about is a CRNA or certified registered nurse anesthetist. So uh, what the, the path is for a CRNA is four years of nursing school, and then they practice as a nurse. Um, now, most CRNA schools require ICU for those two to three years of, of practice uh, as a nurse. Some will take other, um, you know, high level uh, OR experience or ER experience. Um, I'm not entirely familiar with with exactly which ones do what, but um, so you do that. They do that two to three years of uh, of nursing experience, and then they go back and do full time anesthesia training uh, in a in a CRNA school. Um, 
I think most of those now are 36 months and most people who do that now receive a, a doctorate um, with it. So, um, so that, that's kind of the process for becoming a CRNA. Um, when it comes to AAs, and I'll, I'll admit this is the newest one to me and the one I'm least familiar with, but uh, from what I can gather, uh, AAs will do four years of undergraduate, um, and I think they can essentially do any type of, of undergraduate degree that they want. Then I believe they take the GMAT uh, and then um, do somewhere between 28 and 36 months of dedicated uh, clinical anesthesia training, um, and then they they're able to come out and do anesthesia. Um, when it comes to scope of practice and, you know, interrupt me, Justin, if there's anything, you know, you want me to kind of delve into more, if I'm talking about something that, that maybe people don't need to know as much about, but now this is helpful um, for me, especially the CRNA and AA stuff. I, I, you know, I'm familiar and aware of the different tracks. I, it's also, you know, you get into the politics and you and I said yeah. a little bit, like there's plenty to go around. Everyone needs anesthesia. There's this massive demographic thing. There's these, you know, um, expansion of sites of service, all these surgery centers opening up and like, there's just desperate need for anesthesia services. I, you know, I, I don't like to get into the politics yeah, in, in yeah, this neither. format just cause I don't want to get put on blast. So I think we'll yeah. just keep it moving. Yeah. Okay. Sounds good. Yeah. And, and I was going to make that point. I'm making no political statements here. I am making no judgments here. I'm simply laying out the information. Um, and, and the same thing as Justin said, the, the pie is very, very big. And I feel like even if you took every anesthesiologist, every CRNA, every CAA in the entire country, we still don't have enough people to uh, to cover all the anesthesia cases. So that's the little uh, little caveat there. So anyway, um, so then in terms of scope of practice, uh, an anesthesiologist can practice uh, in any state, do any case, no need for any sort of supervision, anything like that. I think most of the, the listeners are... are either in anesthesia or pain medicine. So you guys know that, right? You, you get out and you do anything, anything that basically you're comfortable and trained to do. So um, then if you look at the, the uh, CRNA scope of practice, it's really state dependent. Um, so some states require supervision directly by uh, an MD anesthesiologist. Some allow supervision by any MD. Some states require no supervision at all. Those are called opt-out states. Um, and then the level of supervision uh, required is really state dependent as well. So again, I don't I don't get into all the politics of it. Just again, laying out the the uh, requirements for for each uh, each in particular um, uh, degree. Uh, when it comes to Indiana, which is the state I practice in, uh, when it comes to podi podiatry and dental cases, the state of Indiana requires an MD anesthesiologist involved in those cases. And so interesting, um, I did not know that. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, now there's some other, there's some other kind of fancy things that people do to, to cover the MD portion, but essentially what Indiana requires is an MD to cover those cases, either directly with the CRNA or doing the case itself. So um, that's an Indiana state specific law. I know one of the concerns about that approach is access. And like, you've got your kid who has a toothache, who has to wait six months to get into a you know, surgery center where the MD can do the anesthesia. How, how has your experience been in terms of access for things like dental care? Like I need a root canal. I need whatever that's going to require a little bit more of an invasive procedure. Yeah, that's, that's tough, especially in a state like Indiana. Um, so we just kind of expanded into the dental realm. Um, Indiana had some other uh, issues. The uh, medical licensing board in the state of Indiana up until we did a little lobbying and, and had some things change um, with the help of the Indiana state uh, Society of Anesthesiologists, um, and I think the support of the Indiana, Indiana AANA as well, um, changed some of the the issues in the state of Indiana. But um, basically, what what we do is we have to send an MD, and so we get a lot of calls from from uh, dental practices. A lot of this happens in offices, and so that was that was sort of the the issue we were having was how to do the office based anesthesia. Um, a lot of the dentists, um, in particular have been sort of moved out of the surgery centers and the uh, and the hospitals because especially pediatrics many of those cases are are uh, medicaid they pay pretty well to the dentists uh, but they don't really pay well in terms of facility fees to the facilities so when the facilities look at it they say well you know this is a dental case and sort of they've sort of been pushed out so we we really in terms of access have been trying to help the the uh, the pediatric dentists in particular to to be able to do the anesthesia and so essentially what we do most of the time is just send a send a doc 
Um, or if we can get two rooms going, we can have, you know, docs and CRNAs there and sort of do a, a you know, coverage that way. So, so a CRNA could do dental pediatric anesthesia if there's an, an MD anesthesiologist supervising. sounds like. Yep. Yep. If there's an MD, yeah. MD present that then it, it meets the qualifications. So got it. I'm, I'm just thinking about like, if you're like OMFS and you're like the MD, DMD, yep. maybe you would be then qualified to supervise the CRNA in that context. Yep. Yeah. And so, so there's some offices that are like that, um, where there's an MD present, um, that, uh, it, that are OMFS. And so, um, in that case, you know, it, it probably fulfills that requirement to be able to, to do the, uh, the anesthesia that way with, um, with the CRNA. Once you start to press into this, you kind of realize how, um, and you know, even like the MD needs to supervise the CRNA in states where that's allowed, but it doesn't need to be an anesthesiologist. Like the surgeon is sort of the de facto supervisor, presumably. And I, I kind of wonder how many, especially if you're a surgeon in a hospital where there's changes in the anesthesia model, like if that's something that even those surgeons would realize. Uh, yeah. And that's a conversation that, that I've had uh, multiple times, you know, obviously the, the, a lot of things changed after COVID. Um, yeah. I think a lot of anesthesiologists retired. So there's a, a lot more CRNAs, particularly in Indiana. And so there's some conversations to have with surgeons of, Hey, you know, you're the, um, you're the, I think Indiana proposes it as physician of record. Um, and I'm not, an, I'm not an attorney, so I, uh, I can't make any, <laughs> make any legal claims, but, um, they, they pose it as essentially physician of record. And so the conversation with, with the surgeons is, is had often <laughs> for sure. Yeah. So for our listeners, uh, you know, if you're going to be just understanding what state you're going to be operating in and understanding the law of the land in those states is something that will impact the OR dynamics and also the, like the political dynamics and, uh, institutional dynamics of the places where you're providing care, something to be aware of. Yeah, definitely. You definitely want to check your state requirements, state laws, and then also the, the bylaws of the, the hospital surgery center. I mean, those, those things all come into play as to who can do what in what space. This is so. a good, this brings up a good point. If I'm, you know, moving to a state maybe where I've never practiced, uh, or I'm, you know, it's like back home where my family's from and I did med school in this other place and then residency in this third place. And now I want to go back to the place where I don't even really know how it works. How would I go about yeah. figuring out the, the answers to these questions, either hospital specific or state specific, is there like a central compendium or somewhere in the ASA where we can ask these questions? Yeah, that's, that's a tough one. I don't know that the ASA has anything specifically for each state. Um, you know, I would probably just talk to an attorney, somebody who knows healthcare in that state, even if it's a, you know, hour of conversation, it costs you 500 bucks, at least, you know, what you're getting into in that state. The other thing is your, your practice, unless you're going out and doing low comes and you're kind of totally independent your practice should know so whether you're hospital employed or your uh, private practice or even part of a bigger anesthesia group you, you know somebody within your practice ought to know how things are going um, and and what's allowed and what's not allowed so it's probably a good uh, if you don't already have relationships within your state society that's a, a probably a good place to check in as well and see what kind of resources they have available yeah. And I think the Indiana Society of Anesthesiologists has some of that information. Um, Indiana is, Indiana's, everything's very clearly written. There's not, there's no gray really in the Indiana uh, uh, state law when it comes to, to anesthesia. Um, some states are much more gray. <laughs> so, um, you know, I, I don't practice in a ton of states, but I do have licenses in multiple states. And some of them, um, looking through the, the, uh, the, the law that, you know, the statutes as well as the case law is, is, confusing. So I, I always just ask our attorneys, you know, <laughs> what, what do we need to do in this state? So yeah. I was talking to a client the other day and we were discussing the, uh, the intimate relationship between a, uh, a physician, especially a private practitioner physician yeah. and their healthcare compliance attorney who you're just trusting. Yeah. It's so darn complicated. And we were talking about Stark. I actually heard a new term. There's Stark and then there's mini Stark. I had never heard of mini Stark up until a couple of days ago. But I haven't the, either. The state specific Stark laws that apparently are an appendix to the federal Stark laws. So even if federal Stark says it's okay, mini Stark may preclude it in your state. So you need to make sure that your healthcare compliance attorney knows Stark and mini Stark for whatever state you're operating in. So many ways to step um, on a landmine. 
Oh yeah, and and so the the Stark is more applicable to to hospitals. AKS uh, anti kickback statute is what what we need to worry about in anesthesia, and so there that's that's co complex as well and federal, but is also state specific as well. So we're really really careful in all of our agreements to have all the the, the state specific as well as the federal anti kickback uh, stuff. It's it's a lot more difficult in anesthesia to kind of create an anti kickback situation um it's a lot easier in chronic pain and so i'll admit i'm not a chronic pain physician but it's it's you know you look at you look at who gets accused of anti-kickback and it's not usually anesthesiologist right it's usually the, the pain med doc yeah so. it was in the context of a pain management practice yeah. uh this specific yeah. conversation doctors don't get as many carve outs as corporations turns out when it comes to ownership of medical entities uh, there you go, getting uh, political again. Uh, Got to die on some kind of hill, right? That's right. Um, That's right. talk a little so, bit about. So I think yeah, we were. Go ahead, Brian. Yeah. No, no, please, please go ahead. I was just say talk a little bit about sort of the um, regional differences in what what you're observing because you're you know we've talked a little bit about mutual clients who like we've done anesthesia placements for locums and things and there's different regions of the country have their own flavor for like. Here's how the hospitals work. Here's how the surgery centers work. Here's what, who you're going to mostly find doing certain types of procedures. Here's where it's like the wild west and you have no clue. Like if you're going to have an EM doc doing anesthesia, just kidding. That doesn't happen as far as I'm aware. But um, those types of regional differences, what, what do you see in terms of these sort of different categories of anesthesia providers? Well, the EM docs don't call it anesthesia. They call it a uh, deep sedation. But okay. anyway, I'm just making a joke. <laughs> um, so... So yeah, so regionally it's very, very different. And even um, you know, pockets within regions. So in general, you look at bigger cities, often in bigger cities, there's a lot of anesthesiologists, a lot of direct anesthesiologist care. Um, you know, maybe some supervision or, or direction of CRNAs or CAAs, but just a lot of uh a lot of um uh, direct anesthesiologist care. You get kind of in the rural areas, I think you end up with more CRNAs, either in an ACT model or in a, a sort of independent type practice, if the state allows it, or, um, you know, with uh, with a an anesthesiologist present, but not necessarily uh, medically directing. So I think it's more city versus um, versus rural, uh, more so than necessarily regions of the country. But like we talked about kind of in our our discussion about this this conversation um some states you know are allow caas or certified anesthesia assistance and some don't so um you said in oregon there aren't any caas there uh, here in indiana there are and so caas um i don't know that we got all the way through that but essentially caas require a medical direction model meaning that the anesthesiologist has to meet the seven chapter rules and um anesthesiologist has to be present and medically directing and so that they're uh, they're used in Indiana, particularly in the Indianapolis area. Um, but then there's certain states where they're not used at all. So um, I think that's that's a little bit of the difference in regionality. Um, then there's opt out states where CRNAs can practice without any physician supervision whatsoever. So for instance, Kentucky um, and Michigan, which are both both bordering Indiana, um, in those places you'll find a lot of pure CRNA practices because again, there's it's an opt out state. Although again, if you look at bigger cities versus smaller cities versus towns versus very rural, um, you know, you, you find that there's less anesthesiologists as you kind of come further and further away from a city. So that's what I, I see overall um, in the country. Um, this is a little bit of a deep rabbit hole and a kind of complicated one, but I'm curious how you um, have observed like billing differences in different states and the different ways that um, anesthesia care providers across these different categories bill for their services and how hospitals or whatever the site of services get paid based on who's doing the anesthesia and who's in the room and who's around. Cause I know that some of those yeah. differences often drive the, you know, the, if you don't get paid for something, you're significantly disincentivized to do it. And so right, a lot of yeah. what you're describing is largely, I would, I would surmise is largely driven by what is an insurance company willing to pay for? Yeah, so that's super state specific as well. Um, so, and it's actually payer specific, right? So Medicare and Medicaid uh, make essentially no differentiation. CRNA, MD, CAA, 
the the pay essentially ends up being about the same. Um, you look at the private payers, the Anthems, the Cignas, the Uniteds, that's really state specific to what they do in each state. Um, some states it's equivalent. Some states there's a small difference between the pay for a CAA and an, or a, a CRNA versus an anesthesiologist. Some there's large differences, um, you know, 25, 30%. Uh, so it, it just super, super state specific and, and payer specific. Um, and then the, the other, uh, sort of issue you come out with is business wise, the cost of an anesthesiologist versus CRNA versus a CAA. So it's complicated when it comes to reimbursement versus, um, compensation. And, and there's, you know, it takes, takes quite a bit of, of calculating up to figure out, you know, whether, yeah, what what mix of anesthesia providers in the practice makes the most sense for safe care, but also for financially responsible care? So it's uh, I I don't um, I don't envy some of these hospital administrators who have to make these decisions for sure. Yeah, and that's only on the anesthesia side of the calculation. And then you get into what's the cost of an OR not running, and how much do we have to pay that surgeon, and how is the surgeon getting paid, and like how much of the facility fee is ultimately going to just retain the CRNA or the MDA that's doing the anesthesia? Uh, yep. It does get the math gets complicated. And then the the other issue, and we bring this up over and over again, is the skyrocketing compensation to anesthesia providers. Um, you know, you're looking at somewhere in the 30 to 50% increase range. Um, you know, MDAs may be slightly less than that, but, um, you know, you've got that, that coming along as well. And even now in surgery centers, a lot of these facility fees that used to um, be used to create dividends for the owners are now having to go to pay for anesthesia just because the cost of anesthesia is going up and the reimbursement is going down. And we didn't even talk about this yet, but uh, Medicare again cut the ASA unit uh, from 2117 or something to 2047. So I mean, it's they they dropped it another three point something percent, uh, and it's you know I, I just don't understand. I'm, I'm kind of on a soapbox here, but I don't understand how Medicare CMS can decide that we're now worth less, even though the cost of hiring someone in anesthesia has gone up 30 or 40%. So to me, it doesn't make a whole lot of sense, but. Yeah, 80 bucks an hour, you think you should make more than that before you pay your expenses? <laughs> Is that what Let's the, see. if we yeah. do a 15 minute about, unit? Yeah. I mean, yeah, yeah. So we, you got to take the base units into account though. But yeah, right. so I mean, yeah. let's say your average base unit is five. So you got a base five plus four units would be a base nine. So 180 an hour um, would be, uh, would be, the the max there but i mean that's less than most even crnas and caas are making so i don't know how you you pay for a an anesthesia provider at all with that sort of reimbursement yeah in terms of uh you know for this audience people interested in job switches or looking to understand sort of what's out there you know from your perspective what are some other in, in terms of the topic at hand, some other things that you think people probably aren't aware of or developments or shifts in the industry that are unfolding that are going to impact how anesthesia careers look for the next five to 10 years? Yeah. Um, well, let's see. So, I mean, I, I think compensation, reimbursement, those are kind of big things. Um, we, we certainly, I think in our, our next talk, we'll get into some of the other Big, big topics, which will be the, the the FTC issues and the um, and the No Surprises Act issues and that sort of stuff. But um, you know, I, I think that overall anesthesia compensation is going up. Um, it's probably starting to plateau a little bit, but it's still going up. Uh, so, I mean, I think it's a good time right now to come out into anesthesia. I think you're going to work hard. Um, I think you'll be able to get a job essentially anywhere you want. I don't think there's these pockets where they don't need anesthesiologists anymore. I mean, um, when I came out of residency, I was looking in Austin, Texas, because I had family there and they essentially didn't have a job. Um, now, I think you can get a job anywhere, anytime with pretty good compensation. Uh, so, I mean, I think that's great. Um, I think at some point, the cost of anesthesia is going to start driving hospitals out of business. And so at some point, we're going to have to figure out a way to 
either increase reimbursement from the government and the payers or decrease compensation. I'm guessing now that the horse is out of the barn, we're talking about decreasing, or I'm sorry, increasing reimbursements. I don't think we're now going to go to decreasing compensation, uh, but I could be wrong. Um, so, I, I mean, I think it's a great time to come out into anesthesia. I think as an anesthesiologist, your role is probably going to be a little bit different than it was even when I came out 10 years ago. Um, I think you're going to be managing practices more so, dealing with surgeons. Um, I do a lot of perioperative work on the floor, in the pre-op clinic, that sort of stuff. Um, and I think the EASA recognizes that. So I think that there'll be some big changes in that respect. Um, and I think that it's going to move even more towards that because really we are perioperative specialists um, and, and we're able to really handle anything from pre-surgical to, you know, several days post-surgical. Um, yes. Aside from that, it's hard for me to know exactly how things are going to change, but I would say, uh, I would say it's not going to look like the eighties and nineties where nobody wanted to do anesthesia. I think there's going to be lots of, lots of anesthesiologists, which is good. Um, again, I wish CMS would increase the number of anesthesia residency spots. Um, you know, that would allow us to increase the number of anesthesiologists more quickly, but, uh, with attrition, I, I think we're going to be, we're still going to be, um, more demand than supply for sure. Yeah. It's sobering to consider these for how long it takes to turn the aircraft carrier of like U S government policy and CMS yep. and all that to open up the number of seats. I think it, what is it like 1700 or 1800 per year right now that we're making in terms of new residents. Yeah. Um, in that range, but then you've got, you've got a large cadre of older baby boomer generation anesthesiologists who are either cutting back or retiring. And yeah, yeah, I don't, we're not, we're not keeping pace at all. Um, and neither are, neither are the CAAs or the CRNAs. I mean, not, they're not, you know, because of the length of time that it takes to, to train, you know, they're not keeping up with demand either. So. Yeah. And there are some institutions that allow flexibility for the anesthesiologists and others who are like, we need to mash down the gas pedal because there's so much need. And I can tell you anecdotally from what I've seen, and I'm sure you've seen some of this, it's not just the 57 year old anesthesiologists that are like, I'm done with this. There's 37 year old anesthesiologists tragically who are like getting beaten up and ground into powder and are like, screw this. I didn't sign up for this. And, uh, that ain't good for the, yep. for all of us who are eventually going to need one of those anesthesiologists. And I, the person that puts me under, I don't want them to be burned out, pissed off and ready to, you know, hang up the cleats. I want somebody oh, yeah. who's like present, <laughs> not stressed yes. and yes. engaged in what they're doing, which is why we're here. Yeah. And so, that's, yeah, that's a numbers game. That's a numbers game. We just yes. got to get more. Yes. So Dr. Brian Schmutzler, as always, thanks for joining. So anybody who's interested, check out um, APM success slash 226. This is episode 226. You can check out uh, Brian's um, contact info and some of the links to some of the other initiatives that he's working on. And we'll throw up a couple I'll, I'll try to dig around and find some state specific uh, anesthesia policy and maybe we can throw some links to that or anything that the ASA has. And uh, we'll be back next week talking about some other cool stuff, no surprises act and federal trade commission shenanigans. So thanks, Brian. Hey, thanks. If you liked what you heard this week, head on over to apmsuccess.com where you can find more content and free resources to help you build a successful career in anesthesia and pain management. If you wanted to leave a review in iTunes, I'd also really appreciate it. Thanks for using some of your valuable time to join me today on APM Success.